Okay, so we're still in the early empire, but we're after Octavian Augustus. Um, so um, we looked at Porta uh, Maggiore, which is uh, was built during Claudius's reign. So after Claudius, we have Nero. Uh, Nero is Claudius's stepson and heir. Okay, so Nero becomes the emperor um, in 64 CE. And this is after Rome basically burns down, okay? So there's a massive fire in Rome. There's that um, saying that Nero fiddled as Rome burned. Um, he was not very popular. People did not think that he did very much to alleviate um, the suffering of his people during this time. Um, so one positive thing that Nero did do is he creates a new building code with more fireproofing. So things being made out of less flammable materials and things like that. So that's good. <laughs> um, other than that, he didn't do a whole lot. And, and that was very much the public perception of him, was that he was very narcissistic and self-centered and into glorifying himself and, and didn't do very much for the people. So he was not very popular. Um, so he um, builds this massive complex for himself Unlike some previous structures built by um, emperors, it's not a public forum, so it doesn't have any kind of administrative or public service kind of function. This is his private residence, which he builds in the middle of Rome. Um, it has this massive kind of pool uh, with a little pavilion thing. It has these gardens. It has this 128 foot tall statue of himself as the sun god. Um, it's very luxurious. So the city has, has burned down and people are trying to rebuild and Nero is taking all of the city's money and building this big uh, golden house for himself. The interior of this was all done in fourth style painting. So lots and lots of frescoes. In addition to being lots of frescoes, um, which are expensive, uh, they're almost entirely gilded. So lots and lots and lots of gold applied to the walls and ceilings inside this house. Um, very luxurious. It's designed by Severus and Leeler, who are the um, architects and, and um, engineers, basically. They're very brilliant. They do a lot of interesting things with concrete that we'll talk about in just a second. Um, you can see in the roof there some of the golden uh, gilded frescoes from the ceiling so later spoiler alert the people don't really like this very much and things get built uh, on top of it so you can see this piece of it that exists today this this ruin of it but a lot of it was uh, kind of underground and then it gets discovered later uh, and when archaeologists discover it they're they kind of crack into it and and find all these um, four style sort of fantastical looking vistas that don't totally make sense we remember when we talked about four style painting all these kind of fantasy architecture also seen from mythology there's also all of these hybrid creatures so they're like half human half other things and because this is underground when it's discovered um, they think it's a cave and the Italian word for cave is grotto and when they find all of these weird hybrid animal human things they describe this there's a new adjective called grotesque and this is actually the origin of the word grotesque um, is from the discovery of domus aria domus aria nero's house by the way what does this mean domus we know is the roman word for house and then aria if you've taken chemistry you know that au is the um symbol on the periodic table of elements for gold. So this is the gold house, okay? And is the origin of the word grotesque. Okay, so Nero's gold house. Let's look at some of the uh, brilliant architecture that Severus and Seller um, create. So this is one of the earliest uses of groin vaults. Remember when you have an arch and you extend it backward in space, you have a barrel vault. When you cross two barrel vaults, you have a gro groin vault, which is very structurally significant. It's very, very strong. So you can see on the plane, the X's here are the groin vaults. And they had an oculus in the dome, and then they had these other specialized skylights on either side. So this whole thing is gilded inside, and there are also polished bronze mirrors. 
and it does these really fascinating things with light. It allows light to come into the space and make it all kind of glow and look like it's illuminated by some kind of holy light, okay? Um, so, um, it's very luxurious. It has this really cool thing. We have this huge sculpture of Nero as the sun god. We have all this marble paneling, all this gilded stucco and frescoes, dealt with an oculus. <clears throat> the house is lit by these very specially designed um, skylights and things. Uh, and it's the first time that a house is not limited by vaults, but actually shaped by them. So they actually engineer it with growing vaults and vaulting and domes in mind and figure out all these different kinds of cool things structurally that they can do. Okay, so what happens after this? Uh, Nero dies by suicide in 68 because he was pretty sure that they were coming to assassinate him, which they were. He was very, very unpopular. Um, and this is the end of the Julian line of emperors, okay? So we're still in the early empire, but we've run out of Julians, okay? We've run out of this dynasty. So um, there's a year of conflict, there's a lot of indecision, people are generally really unhappy, and then the victor out of all this um, conflict is a guy named Vespasian, okay? And he, um, he had been a general under both Claudius and Nero, he was a very popular like highly decorated general. His family name is Flavius, so his name is Vespasian Flavius. Um, his sons are Titus and Domitian, who both become emperors after him. And so we have the Flavian dynasty named after this guy. And by far their best known achievement during their reign is this structure, which is the Colosseum, which is one of the most famous structures in the world. Um, so this is massive. Um, it's a massive structure. 56,000 spectators could sit here. And where did they build it? Well, they built it right on top <laughs> of the Thomas Aria. So um, the Vespasian comes in and he's like, okay, I want people to like me. Everybody hated Nero. So what should I do? I should build something for public use. I'll, big, I'll build the biggest amphitheater ever which it's technically called the Flavian Amphitheater, um, but it's nicknamed the Colosseum, and that's the name that's kind of stuck. Do you know why it is called that? It is called that because they took that gigantic Colossus statue of Nero as Sol, as the sun god, and melted that thing down and built this on top of where it stood, okay? So it's actually named after, the Colosseum is actually named after um, Nero's crazy huge self-portrait, <laughs> okay, which is kind of interesting when you think about it. Um, all right, so it's built, so this is built on the grounds of uh, Nero's artificial lake and gardens. Um, okay, Titus ends up finishing this. It isn't finished during Vespasian's lifetime. It's finished in 80 CE. It absolutely could not have been built without concrete. So it's another testament to the structural ingenuity of the Romans and the way that they used uh, concrete and arches and barrel vaults to create these really incredible structures. So what we see today is the concrete skeleton of this. Um, when it was originally built, all of the seats, the Theatron area and uh, the exterior were all faced in marble. So it's the interior structure was concrete and then everything was covered in marble. So it was really beautiful and shiny. Um, that was all stripped away when Rome falls. Um, but basically, the way that it is made is out of concrete and then it has this really complex structure of barrel vaults. So you can kind of see in the cross section up here, those aren't just arches, they're barrel vaults that go all the way through the structure and support everything. It was a really advanced kind of system for the arena in the center where it could be this sand covered uh, flat surface where gladiators could fight or animals could fight or there could be musical and theatrical performances. Um, and there's a system of different doors and different entryways. So like gladiators fighting, you could spring some like lions up on them or something. Um, it also could be flooded and they could stage sea battles here with their gladiators as well. So very, um, very advanced, very technological kind of theater for the time. Um, it's about the height of a 16 story building. So it's quite large. 
and uh, yeah, like I said, we uh, were missing all the marble facing that was originally part of it. It's pretty fantastic. You can go and see it if you're in Robe. You, you can uh, tour it. Okay, so as I've said before, like in fashion, trends and art history kind of go back and forth. So we had the, the preference for the youthful portrayal uh, during the early, early, early empire of Octavian Augustus. But then, because Nero also portrayed himself as, as youthful and, and, and uh, timeless and actually portrayed himself literally as the sun god, Vespasian wants to distance himself from Nero because Nero was so hated by the public. So we have kind of a pendulum swing in um, the stylistic preferences in the sculptural world and uh, Verism is back. Okay, so he wants people to see that he is unpretentious, that he is an army general who's had a long, successful, hard-fought life. Um, he wanted to distance himself as much from Nero's extravagance as possible, so we have Verism again. You can see all of his wrinkles, you can see that he's going bald, and he's like, this is what I look like, here's, here's how I am. So he breaks this tradition of Augustan um, kind of godlike emperors. Okay, um, another kind of uh, technological breakthrough in, in terms of art is the invention of the corkscrew grill, drill. So um, Flavian women's fashion was pretty wild at the time, and this was the uh, hairstyle preferred by women in Rome during the Flavian dynasty. So it's kind of like a really interesting mullet. <laughs> so you have these curls in the front that are stacked up really high, this would be curled using like a hot piece of metal and kind of like a early version of a curling iron. And sometimes I think they used wax or something to hold it. So you'd have your curls all stacked up in the front. You'd have very long hair in the back that would be braided and then the braids would all be wrapped around in this big bun in the back. So this is the kind of hairstyle that was popular um, at this time. And for sculptors to be able to capture this look, they invent a new kind of drill to use specifically for sculpture. So they, uh, up until this point, we're just using a hammer and chisel. They developed this hand cranked uh, cork, corkscrew drill to uh, facilitate making all these piles of curls. It is a useful invention because it can also be used later when beards become popular, which we'll talk about. So we now have a new uh, technique and tool for sculpture that comes out of this time period. Okay. This is the Triumphal Arch of Titus. So this is another kind of monument that um, becomes popular during this time period. So we've seen the Altar of Augustan Peace, um, which is kind of like this standalone thing that's not exactly a building, but not exactly a sculpture. It's just kind of this monument structure. Triumphal arches are the same kind of thing. Um, they're just freestanding arches. And they're used to commemorate a wide range of things. So sometimes they commemorate specific victories, uh, like military battles and victories. Sometimes they just commemorate an emperor or a significant person who has died. So Titus uh, is the emperor and he dies in 81 and his brother Domitian builds an arch uh, in his honor. Okay, so these are the, the next two Flavian emperors. Um, so this is the uh, triumphal arch of Titus. Uh, on the front, so you have kind of the rectangular shape and then the arch and then the space up above the arch That's called the spandrels. So in the spandrels we uh, See sculpture and then on the inside of the arch we see sculpture and the, and the coffered decorative kind of ceiling inside the arch itself as well um, so in the spandrels on this it's showing uh, Titus's apotheosis so he becomes a god he gets uh, voted to be by the Senate and by his brother, who's the emperor who succeeds him, he um, has the apotheosis and, and becomes deified. The thing that's the opposite of apotheosis that the Senate can also vote is called damnatio memoriae, and this means that you are damned by the Senate and uh, your image is damned. So people destroy, they destroy images of you um, and you, uh, your name is not to be said anymore. So that's what they do to Nero. So they destroy his sculptures and he is like, not to be named anymore. So you either can be made a god or you can be damned by the Senate, either, either thing. Okay, so next we will talk about the High Empire.